Do you recommend bariatric surgery? You know, it's interesting how, when, you th <laughs> when you think about it, how much bariatric surgery do, do they do in the, with the Tarahumara Indians? <laughs> They're never obese. How much do they do with the Papua Highlanders in New Guinea? Or anybody in, in Okinawa who hasn't been exposed to the United States Air Force PX diet, but are eating a typical Okinawan diet, or rural China, or Central Africa. No, obesity doesn't exist. And, you know, is it, would it be better to eat a horrible toxic diet and have to have bariatric surgery in this country, or would it be better to do what some of these other nations are doing? I think history will uh, record, for example, I, it comes to, uh, to my, uh, my head. When I first went into uh, general surgery in uh, 1969, uh, uh, one of the most common operations there was in surgery was gastrectomy for duty and ulcer disease. And uh, there were all kinds of arguments about what was the type of gastric resection ought to be done. And then lo and behold, what should happen? I mean, there were there were there were entire practices where surgeons only did was this gastric surgery for duty and ulcer. And what happened was uh, these two guys from Australia, I think Warren and Matthews, uh, said, you know, these gastric specimens that you surgeons are handing off to us after you remove them, they have bacteria. But the surgeons who were so wise would say, no, no. This is a stomach with 10th normal hydrochloric acid. There can't be any bacteria there. Well, they stuck with that and they analyzed those bacteria and they did the experiment on themselves and they discovered the bacteria was Helicobacter pylori. So when these patients come in with problems with duodenal and ulcer, all you had to do was give them two weeks of antibiotic. It was completely gone, no operation. So what happens? <laughs> Historically, when we look back at that era, it was just crazy. And the same thing happens <clears throat> in breast surgery. Uh, when I, <clears throat> uh, Halstead, Johns Hopkins, William Halstead, in 1882, devised the radical mastectomy. He was such a towering figure that all of his residents who went out to become chairman of surgery departments perpetuated this. And for really, for 100 years, the radical mastectomy was a standardized surgical error. And they were absolutely tough, hard, bitter arguments about this. And finally, it was all put to rest when a, a large randomized control study was done, clearly showing the radical mastectomy, which was very mutilating and disfiguring, was no more curative <clears throat> than lesser procedures. Now, the same thing I'm, I just know is going to happen in bariatric surgery. People are, are just not going to <laughs> continue to be treated with that kind of surgery. And, then, and then now, of course, it has the, these side effects. And many of those patients, after a period of time, will regain their weight. So it would not, so would anybody, I mean, I've had a patient who weighed 500 pounds come through our program. I just got a call from him last week. He's now, lost 200 pounds. He's no longer in congestive heart failure. No, no operation. Just spending time with the patient and having him have a willingness to make significant nutritional change. Yeah. A recent study claimed vegans have more bone fractures. Is this true? You know, I haven't had a chance to really review that, but I, uh, <clears throat> if you notice, and if you read my book, the diet that we propose <clears throat> is whole food plant-based nutrition. And when you look at what our vegans are eating, vegans can eat French fries. Vegans can eat oil. Vegans can, I mean, <laughs> eat glazed donuts. Uh, and, and so I, uh, my preference would be to look at whole food plant-based nutrition. Uh, and I'm not, not really quite sure uh, until I see that study uh, 
uh, but remember the key thing in, in osteoporosis, people are getting an adequate amount of calcium, so forth, and vitamin D. Uh, the bones love stress and walking doesn't do it. But uh, as you get older, you want to be sure to still have some stress on your bones, whether you want to do it with, I mean, granted, things like deadlifts and lunges and, and squats with a weight have proved to be beneficial for restoring and turning around osteopenia. Uh, but those can be a little cumbersome. And perhaps for many people, it's easier just to get a knapsack with a number of books in it so it's got some weight. And maybe wear that uh, for several hours, uh, hour, maybe an hour or two a day. And then your bones say, wait a minute, when did so-and-so gain this weight? Then they respond to that stress by uh, strengthening. Sometimes it's easier to buy a weighted vest over the internet. You just mentioned the calcium. Obviously, we, we need calcium. What's wrong with cheese? Well, you know, that's about the worst food you can eat. I mean, cheese is just terrible with all that casein, and, which is the major protein in dairy. And casein was beautifully shown by studies with T, my friend T. Colin Campbell, who wrote the China study, uh, how important that was in, in promoting cancer growth. And there's a wonderful study from Harvard showing how aggressive casein is in contributing to vascular disease. So, yeah, I, I don't I don't think there's any argument there. Cheese is just is all it is is loaded with with calories and other nutrients that are going to injure you. And what about yogurt? What's wrong with yogurt? Don't we need probiotics? Well, no, wait a minute. Now, yogurt also has casein. Eh? We just talked about that. So it's, it's the same argument applies there. And do, don't we need what? Uh, yogurt, uh, probi probiotics that come with oh, the yogurt. Yeah. Uh, the whole probiotics thing is still, I think, so far from being solidly researched. No, I, <clears throat> I think it, probiotics, is that what the Tara Humar are eating? <laughs> is that what those people in Okinawa are eating? Probiotics? Or the Papua Highlanders? No, I, let's, let's really wait till we get absolutely rock solid research. It's really, I think what constantly comes back, and we're gonna to come to that when you ask me about supplements. Time and again, if you look carefully at it, you get your supplements, you get your vitamins and nutrients safely from food. Your body knows how to deal with it. But when you wander away from that and you start taking these mega doses, that's not the way the reactions in the body were designed to be. And that's why we often see increased risk of heart disease or cancer in those supplement studies. Yeah. 